So the story about the, our cooperation with China and the can divide into two parts. The before 2005, when China was the one of the major and recipient countries of WP, and after 2005, China became a NATO and donor to WP. Because of food security, people were able to not just survive, but thrive. Hello, my name is Siddharth Chatterjee, the UN Resident Coordinator in China, and welcome to Delivering as One, a UN and China Conversation. In this podcast, we highlight the heads of UN agencies in China who shape our diversity, discover their motivations, and find out about their work here on the ground. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Chu, representative of the and country director of the World Food Programme in China. Dr. Chu, a Chinese national, joined the United Nations in China in 2016. Dr. Chu, welcome to Delivering as One. Well, uh, thank you, and I'm really glad to have this and the thought and the philosophy exchange. Fantastic. Welcome again. So let's get started. Tell us about your early life, your education and your work, something about your growing up, your studies, your early career. Well, actually, I'm from the uh, small village in the uh, rural area of the southern Hunan province, which is also located in the southern China. I was born there and uh, grew up there, and I finished my education, or mainly, and uh, actually, I finished my uh, senior and middle school education at the age of 14. It's quite an earlier age and compared with most of the, the children at that time. I entered the college in 1980. So between 1977 and 1980, well, in fact, I became a farmer in my hometown. And I worked on together with my, my family members and for, for nearly two years. I did on every kind of the farming work, you know, mainly in the, in the rice production, of course. And then and in 1980, I entered the Hunan Agriculture College at that time. Right now it's called Hunan Agriculture University. I majored in agronomy. Well, in my childhood, I was deeply impressed by the shortage of the food. Because I clearly still remember, and in later 1970, one year, I, my family had to borrow about 500 kilograms of rice from the production team at that time. And uh, because I'm the, the fifth child of my family, and before me, I've got uh, four elder sisters. And they worked very hard, and uh, my parents also worked very hard, but I still could not earn enough to uh, feed the family. Of course, partly due to the, the low productivity and low production. So now, right now, of course, and everybody, and uh, we don't have any worry about the food. But during my childhood, uh, that's a really remember and uh, the time we suffer from the charge of the food. I and uh, started in the College of Agriculture University in Hunan for four years, and I graduated in the, uh, four years after as one of the best graduates, and then joined the Ministry of Agriculture. And I did not expect and I could join the central government industry to work. At that time, going to the, the system, I was required and uh, assigned to work in the Ministry of Agriculture. And I also did not expect that I would be engaged in international cooperation. So I had to uh, pick up on uh, English because and I, I did not study too much English even and before my, uh, I entered the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture. So and, uh, I learned English in the English training and organized by the Nanjing Agriculture University for two years. Then I worked mainly in the, in, in the Department of International Cooperation, Ministry of Agriculture uh, for nearly 33 years. And then from the, starting from the program officer and to deputy chief to chief to DDG and also the director general of the Center for International Cooperation Service. Then later on, I came back to the department as the DG council. That's the, the, the general and career. During my, my time with the Ministry of Agriculture, I was responsible for the cooperation, all the RBA agencies. I was responsible for them, for cooperation with FAO, WP, and EFAD as well at that time. Because and, uh, only after 2000, when Ministry of Agriculture handed over the engagement with IFAD to Ministry of Finance. I was also responsible for the better cooperation with um, African countries and, and Asian, also and, and Oceanic countries, or American countries. So I'm very glad and I have, I've got a, such kind of experience of international cooperation with many countries. Fascinating. Uh, you know, Dr. Chu, it gives me a whole new perspective about you just hearing this. And I think countless young people in China and all over the world will be very fascinated by your story. So you're a good example of overcoming the challenges of SDG 1 and SDG 2. 
of hunger and of poverty, of deprivation, and in a large family of five, you know, and then being the youngest to have got into, graduated from school, got into university and got a break. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, I think uh, you kind of epitomize that chapter of China where merit, hard work, you know, despite the odds are where the direction is. I'm really um, impressed to hear this and, and I'm sure we'll make sure that this message goes out because this message is important for the youth of the entire world, well, if I which are imagine, still struggling. Yeah, my generation of my age and experience the, the time before the opening up and the beginning of the opening up and until now, even the post-industrialization post of China. So that's an, uh, quite a valuable experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Dramatic. And that transformation from 1980 to date is dramatic. Wow. So let's start about uh, your career with the United Nations in China. How did you eventually come to work with the UN in China in uh, 2016? Yeah, no, actually, I worked in the, in the FA office and uh, also WP office before. I worked in the FA office and, uh, during the 1987 to 1989, and uh, also in the WP office from 1992 and to 1993. At that time, I worked in the two office and uh, on the government's economy. And in fact, because and the government and of China also WP decided and also recognized the big potential and to strengthen transform the cooperation in the new time in the new era, and they want to help and to get a, a qualified Chinese and to work to head the, the WP office in China. Mm -hmm. So that's why and I came and joined the, the WP office on the, quite formally compared with the, when I worked in the two office on the government's economy, and because at that time. And the government and the WP recognize that there's big potential for WP to get more fund from China to support its global operation, and also a good opportunity to expand the South-South cooperation. Yeah. And also, of course, and China started to engage in the wrap-up of the, the poverty at that time. Mm -hmm. Right now, of course, they, they starting the implementation of the strategy of the rural revitalization. Mm -hmm. uh, they think and it's good to, to have a Chinese, the government decided to, to work together with the WP, WP China office colleagues. Excellent. And I think, you know, perhaps this is where the real push will need to be about, you know, the rural revitalization opens up a chapter where you can also minimize inequalities. And and I know that you're a great champion of gender. So I think putting a gender lens and young people's lens on this is going to be absolutely crucial. So thank you for that. So what does your organization do to support the people of China, the country's priorities and the UN family at large? Well, WP and it came to China, as you know, as one of the five and UN agencies and, and which came to China quite early at the beginning of the opening up. So was this 1979? Yeah. And in fact, I saw the story about the, our cooperation with China and they can be divided into two parts. The before 2005, when China was the one of the major and the recipient countries of WP. And after 2005, China became a NATO and donor to WP. So the before 2005, and the, when China was the one of the major recipient countries of WP assistance, WP provided about uh, 4 million tons of wheat mainly and, uh, to China and uh, for implementing the project and mainly in the form of the food for work. Right now we call it food for assets in WP. Mm -hmm. And uh, the project are uh, located in, in all every province of China, even including the bigger cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Tianjin and Wuhan and Xi'an. And uh, the, the total number of the projects funded by WP reach uh, more than 70 large scale projects. And with 30 and a million Chinese people directly benefited from the implementation of those projects. And many of the projects are still very much sustainable for more than 30 years. I remember and we used to receive the visitors from outside and send by WP to come to China to have a look at those and the projects. So the projects are really under one the good reputation of WP. And of course, and after 2005, and particularly and after the transformation of the WP China office, Right now, now we and uh, cooperated with China and mainly in the four major areas. Number one, uh, we WP China office act as a center for excellence for rural transformation. WP and we have uh, three centers of excellence. One is in Brazil, and China center of excellence. The second one, and uh, in 19, 2019, and we had a third one in Côte d'Ivoire. Yeah. So now WP China office acts also as a center of excellence to promote South-South cooperation. And for this, and um, we're many events, uh, we we are reluctant uh, have you and to, to support us. And uh, for this, and uh, we working in four main areas, thematic areas. 
Number one is the smallholder value, value chain capacity development. Number two is the post harvest loss management and the food system. Number three and the, the risk reduction and the climate change adaptation. Number four thematic areas is the innovative and the rural revitalization and the poverty reduction. And for the South South Corporation, we have successfully developed good partnership with many other partners, including the Ministry of Agriculture, of course, Ministry of Emergency Management, and the Ministry of Commerce and Silica, and also Ministry of Ecology and Environment, and also the National Food and Strategic Reserve Administration. And we and, uh, and have gotten a strong support from those ministries. Of course, there are many partners and, uh, from the research, from the colleges, also from the private sectors as well. This is number one pillar of our business. Number two, and uh, since now WP now is coming back and, well, and uh, to be more active and uh, compared with the period 2005 to 2015, because at that time WP was a little bit silent because we stopped the operation of project or system in China. And uh, in order to show our added value of our WP presence in China, and uh, we implemented some pilot projects in China to support China's right now the rural revitalization campaign. And we have three kinds of pilots right now in China going on. Number one is the preschool nutrition improvement. This kind of, we have four projects going on, including the project in Guangxi, in Hunan, in Sichuan, and in Gansu. Yeah. And the other category of the domestic pilots is the, the smallholder value chain development. We have two projects, one is in Anhui, another one is in Gansu. The third and the category project pilot we have well, that's the resilience, the agriculture insurance. That's a newly started project in the Jilin province. This is the, the, the second and, uh, pillar of engagement. The third one, of course, WP, as you know, is merely funded by the voluntary contribution. And uh, WP office and, uh, has the obligation to raise more funds from China, including from the government or from the market, the individual, to support WP and operations. All the right now, and uh, we are expecting China is growing a bigger donor to WP. I think it, it takes time, and we need to be patient. And the, the fourth, as you know, now we are also and, uh, try to support um, the, the construction of the UN Humanitarian Response Paper called the UNHRD, yeah, which is the uh, good network operated by WP to support the uh, support to the UN wide or global wide and humanitarian uh, operations. So that's the four pillars of our engagement. And uh, in the delivery of the, those engagements, uh, we are very much uh, clearly minded. We must be and uh, deliver our activities in a strong and uh, partnership and also an uh, innovative or innovation way. We, we are not uh, simply repeat what we did previously or what we are doing in the other countries. So we must uh, do our cooperation, promote our cooperation well aligned with the government strategy, of course with the UN and the CT and the strategy as well. So that's the, the general things. Regarding the, the UN and family, of course, and, and we try and very hard to cooperate and with the sister agencies and under the framework of the UN the cooperation framework under the leadership of your Excellency and, and share information and try and do things together and in the supplementary way. And of course, and for improve this, and there are a lot of things we can, we can do, in fact. Great. I mean, what puzzles me, Dr. Chu, is that China's got less than 10% of the world's arable land, and still it can feed over 1.4 billion people. Now, that's quite dramatic. My, most of my career has been in Africa, and I've been pushing that Africa could be the breast basket of the world. You know, it's got 60% of the world's arable land, and yet Africa is a net importer of food, and a lot of the agriculture is lost, it's post-harvest loss, you know, a huge amount, 50 to 60% to post-harvest loss. I think so much of knowledge can be shared and which is what I'm very keen to see in our South-South cooperation more than anything else is the intellectual resources that, uh, you know, that China can really share. And I see WFP has a very critical role on uh, making sure that, you know, we achieve food security because food security has multiple aspects to it. That is what it did in China. Because of food security, people were able to not just survive, but thrive. And I think those are important lessons. So I, I commend um, your leadership and the role that you all are playing here as an organization on that. So well done. Could you provide some insight on your key beneficiaries of your organizations here in China? Yeah, and before I, I, I provide my experience and 
your question, I would like to uh, provide some information to the previous comments. And actually, uh, the experience and the China harvested from its uh, more than 40 years experience uh, were to uh, achieve the objective of the food security. And uh, first, we need to attach a lot of importance to the policy, red policy. Then second, the application of the technology. Then third one, enough inputs. Input, including the physical inputs and also labor inputs. So that's a very, the, the fundamental and the experience and for, for China and the, the whole country achieved the objective of food security and with such a limited arable land and the, yeah, in such a, a short time after the opening up. And regarding our the, the kidney beneficiaries, as I uh, briefed to you, and uh, now and, uh, we are implementing three categories of, of pilots in China. And uh, one of the big and category of our intervention is the preschool nutrition improvement. And uh, right now, and as you know, all the China has achieved tremendous and progress in many objectives, in many areas. But the gap is parity between the urban areas and the rural areas even between the better developed rural areas and the, the backward rural areas, still very big, very large. And one of the aspects of this gap is nutrition. For example, now the government has a college program. Well, there are two kinds of programs that the government have been implementing. One is the first thousand day of life program, which is very familiar to you. Another one is the so-called compulsory education and school feeding program. In fact, but they, there's no such a national-wide and a program to cover the preschool children. That means and for, to benefit the children between two and the six or five. Yeah. But in fact, and many of the, the children in the less developed uh, rural areas, they are left behind the children, mm -hmm. and their parents are working in the urban areas, and they are left with their grandparents, grandparents mm -hmm. even nobody take care. And there are many and their children are also from the, the former and the poverty-speaking households. And uh, their nutrition status and, and they were near to be and further enhanced and improved. So that's the entry point for WP to come in to work together with the government. We have been implemented a full and the preschool nutrition and improvement projects in the former poor county area, mm -hmm. counties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now the, the full project are benefiting about uh, more than 7,000 uh, kids in the rural uh, kitchen gardens. We are they improve their kitchen and their dining facilities, conditions, and we provide and nutrition breakfast and lunch. Also, and we are provided the, the, the training on nutrition and to the and the, the, the caregivers, to the parents, to the, the workers in the, the kindergarten. And we also are working together with the, the some of the small holders who have the interest to provide fresh material to the kindergarten for cooking. I think this innovation is very it's very meaningful and. Uh, uh, this is one of the, the orientation, the, uh, the future things we need to continue. Great. And you know, I think globally, and I've seen this in India, in Africa, many parts of the world, is the challenge of micronutrient deficiency, you know, that first 1,000 days of life or the first five years of life, where you see the lack of access to, you know, simple things like iron and folates and you know, iodine and zinc and how, what it does to the child's brain development because, you know, that's so crucial. So, you know, I just think that one of what I've experienced through my career in whether it was in South Sudan or in, you know, Darfur or in Somalia was this recurring challenge of micronutrient deficiencies in the first 1,000 days of life. And I think, you know, globally, I think it, WFP together with China and a few other member states could really tackle this problem, we would be able to overcome a lot of these challenges because a lot of these children grow up because they've got the immunization, etc. But they are unemployable because of the cognitive deficiencies that yeah. they have. And it's, it's a major challenge. And I've seen this firsthand. So, you know, it's so important that you're yeah, doing I feel this. I here that Delta is very important for the, those kids and for their proper release of their potential and future career and the career and the achievements. Absolutely. It's very important. Absolutely. Otherwise, you know, difficult. You know. And, you know, people don't realize that how much micronutrients make. You may be food surplus, but if you're micronutrient deficit, you may have all the rice and all the maize, but if you don't have those basic micronutrients, and the challenge I've seen, Dr. Chu, is that we tend to look at the micronutrient challenge or the issue of malnutrition from the time of birth. 
to me, it should be from the point of conception. That means you have to address the nutritional deficiency with a mother when she conceived. Most of the times, the mothers themselves are malnourished. They are, you know, they have a deficiency of iron, they are anemic. So already they are having children who are going to be inside the womb itself. The big challenge I've seen in Africa and parts of India too, is also they are very young when they get married. And repeated pregnancies leads to stunting and wasting within the womb. Right. So by the time the child has arrived because of repeated pregnancies. So I think, you know, we've got our work cut out. If we want to kind of really see, you know, children develop, we'll have to look at the whole perspective from a gender lens and look at the whole, right. you know, from right. the point of conception on. Yeah, yeah well, the newly on the launch on the project of such kind, uh, we are putting much more attention to the women empowerment or the parents empowerment. Yeah. And in fact, as a WP, I'm the focus on the zero hunger and mm -hmm. also nutrition improvement. Mm -hmm. So I think in China, and in the future, the macronutrient deficiency is one of the areas we need to look at, take care of. In fact, and we have another and the value chain development project in Gansu, which also provides strong support to the nutrition intervention of WP in China. Excellent. Because the project and the Gansu, one of the projects is the zinc rich potato pilot project. Yeah, and I think this is the first kind of such kind in China. I also, I think, believe in the world. And we are and, and try to and screen the, the rich, the zinc rich and varieties, and, and together with the application of the zinc fertilizer, then to increase the content of the zinc in the potato, and for better price of, of, of selling the, the potato, and also and for the better nutrition consumption. That's, that's another good example, anyway. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. All right. So, can you um, identify some of the remaining development challenges faced by China in the coming years and how your organization as part of the UN family here in China will assist China in achieving all the SDGs? Well, as you know, and after 2020, and China has started the implementation of the rural revitalization strategy. Uh, the 14th five-year plan also. In that. Yeah, and it has an quite a wide scope of the objectives, too many things, that too many things we can work together with the government. But uh, what we are going to do and in China, we need to uh, uh, align well with the rural revitalization strategy of China, but also we need to stick to the strategy of WP. WP and, uh, we and, uh, at the end of last year developed a new strategy plan, and we need to and, uh, align our engagement in China with that new strategy. And I think and, uh, in the future, and, uh, we need to and, uh, strengthen our position in China from the lens of the nutrition improvement and also smallholder and uh, resilience capacity. Nutrition, macronutrition is one of the things China and many places are very much natural disaster prone areas. And uh, the smallholders are not, in many places they are very weak in, in the capacity to deal with the disasters. So that's the, another way and uh, another area we need to step in. But anyhow, and, um, and the way and where we can go and what we can do together with the government. And to a large extent, uh, this is another aspect, is also determined in consultation with our donors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because we cannot decide and, uh, freely and, uh, what we can do and we need to consult with our, with our donors. To some extent, they, they, they decide, they tell us, and uh, you can go there and you can do this. Yeah. Anyway, and, uh, we are not regarding WP as a provider of assistance to China. We think under the WP in China right now, in a new time, in a new area, is the provider of platform. We and do things together with the partners, with the technical partners, with the funding partners. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unlike in the past, and we provide a large scale and the food for work and yeah. certain projects. So that's why the partnership is really, very important to WP China. If we really want to further and succeed, we really want to set up a very powerful, strong partnership. Again, this partnership including our uh, collaboration with the UN city, UN country team, and uh, collaborate with other UN sister agencies. Yeah. And we need to share more information. And uh, even before the project design, we need to uh, discuss with each other. Yeah. And we need to display the strength of WP and strength and also the other agencies' strength. And uh, recently, I had a good conversation with some other agencies, including the, the Zokai, the UNS, and the UN women also approached us. And maybe in the future, and, uh, we need to consider and how we could uh, and work together with those agencies. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So if you recall, you know, the discussion that we had with the Ireland, Irish ambassador's uh, residence yeah. some time back um, last year, where we were looking at how we could all work together in rural transformation. But, you know, I'm convinced, uh, Dr. Jude, if you look at Africa, by 2030, the agro-business will be $1 trillion worth. It's an opportunity to, first of all, have food systems transformation in Africa. Number two, it is going to be the largest generator of employment across the entire value chain because unemployment is a major challenge. But number three, it brings a return of investment. So I see huge opportunities where the UN system, together with WFP and the Rome-based organizations, can actually provide that platform of South-South collaboration which brings scale to the agriculture setting. I think what we are missing in the South-South space is how do we bring real scale where we can impact the lives of millions and millions and millions of people. Actually, you have an, uh, hit on another very important aspect of our engagement in China. What I said and, and, uh, previously is to support China's only effort within China and uh, to work together with China to support its uh, higher level international engagement is mm -hmm. another thing. Yeah, That's uh, also a very important area for us to, to promote. For example, and, uh, again, and, uh, Last Friday, we launched the Knowledge Sharing Platform and embedded with the uh, Cloud School. That's good, another good example. And uh, we'll give you another example. And uh, we are right now and helping promoting the rest value chain capacity development with some African countries. Mm -hmm. And we started with the uh, Crediva, and right now we are thinking of some other countries. Fantastic. Last Friday, and I talked this and uh, with uh, an AU ambassador to China, Ms. Osman. I hope and we could add further uh, exchange ideas with him, with the AU ambassador also. The concerned and the African country ambassador. Yeah, so rest value chain is one of the currently three value chains we are promoting with our partners. The other value chains including the cassava value chain. Mm -hmm. Cassava is also one of the staple food in Africa. Absolutely. Another value chain, the Jun mm -hmm. and value chain. You're familiar with you attended, yeah, you attended the, the, the many events regarding the Jun application. Yeah. So South South cooperation is really very important and China has a very rich and uh, experience and applied uh, technology to, to, to be shared with other developing countries uh, to support other countries uh, and the capacity and the progress in food security and nutrition improvement. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And there is money to be made in it. So people will actually, there will be like, it's not just a seen from a point of charity or aid, but this becomes a good tradable commodity because yeah. the world's population will be 10 billion by 2050. Investing in agriculture now ensures food security into the future. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, it gives a good insight on the important work that WFP is doing in China under your leadership. So now let's move to your own life, your daily life. Uh, you know, what does your daily life, what does every day for you look like? Well, and I try to and, uh, keep myself and, uh, fit and energetic so that you can and, uh, do things you, you want to do. I usually and, uh, come to the office at around 8 o'clock mm -hmm. and uh, leave the office at around 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my work time in the office, I prefer to talk to colleagues. If they have anything and uh, want to talk to, with me, I usually prefer to go to the office and then have a face-to-face -face conversation. Mm -hmm. Rather than you pick up a phone, you talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I really want to inspire and, uh, and colleagues and, and take their initiative to promote, to deliver their work. I think and, uh, I need to and, uh, focus on three things in my office time. Number one, I need to ensure the office move in the right orientation. That is well aligned with the UNSTCF and uh, the government strategy and WP mandate. Second, and uh, we need to maintain a very good and uh, of its teamwork. That's very important. Of course, there's space for us to further improve. Third of all, I need to well undertake the responsibility for creating and maintain a good external environment. So I need to uh, maintain our personal uh, linkage contact with the various partners. Yeah, that's my responsibility. And why I want to do this is because I see and it's really meaningful in the role of, of my, myself right now. I, I try my best to make it more meaningful and uh, to try to bring more added value to the role of my current post. For example, now in, in China, we really want to work in better and better innovative way to support China's own domestic efforts. But also, we want to work together with China partners, government partners and also non-government partners to support and, um, the other different countries by sharing China, China's experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then after work, and, uh, I mainly do four things. Cooking food for my family, I'm going to cook. 
Very good. So how big is your family? Wife and daughter. How old is your daughter? Daughter is about 30. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you would have a daughter who's six years old. You're so young looking. <laughs> well, 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 that's it. Uh, people like you are uh, looking quite, quite young. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's uh, the usual. Uh, Fantastic. So you actually go home and cook. Cook, yeah. yeah. That's, that's gender equality yeah. in, in motion. Yeah. Well yeah. done. And, then, and also, I, I do and, uh, some sports on the, and the fitness machine. Mm-hmm. And recently I bought it on the elliptic and the motion machine. I, Fantastic. I do sports there. And also and, uh, watching TV a lot. Any kind of program, usually and, uh, at home, I, I will not uh, think about the office things. I right. just focus on enjoying my family life. Mm-hmm. And the fourth one, uh, well, recently I started to play electric and uh, pipe, which is a new kind of pipe, music instrument. Wow. Yeah, try. So that, there's many four things. I practice the, the electrical pipe on at least one hour a day. Fantastic. Usually at, at the weekend, uh, two hours a day, one in, in, in the morning, one in the, morning in the afternoon. So your evening is quite busy. You get home, you cook, yeah. you watch TV, yeah. you do exercise, yeah. and then you practice the pipe. So what time do you sleep? Well, usually I sleep at around 10. I get up at 5.30. Well, of course, and I'm also very much lucky to make friends. I usually meet my, my friends and from the hometown, from, mm-hmm. from the, 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 the Village, previous yeah. and mm-hmm. partner institutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are too many things. I do not feel any, uh, isolated at all. <laughs> so it's a busy every day is busy. busy yeah yeah i feel quite quite, quite a fool like, actually in my, my daily life excellent yeah. excellent yeah. so you know before we go on to the next question my biggest worry about china is the high levels of diabetes and hypertension which is going up you know more and more young people and it's again diet related it is food related and in fact i did an interview around the winter olympics and i said you know what is it that we could do as the UN family to kind of bring awareness on this important aspect? Now, you have a healthy lifestyle, you know, whereas many don't have that healthy lifestyle. They're eating a lot. They're not exercising. And as a result, they've started to get diabetic and all that. I mean, it would be good to explore some ideas together. What is it that we could do in terms of promoting healthy behavior, which prevents non-communicable diseases like diabetes and hypertension? Well, you are a good example, and you do a lot of sports, including the, the handstand and mm-hmm. the headstand, and also you eat a very little. And I also learned from you, I do not eat a big and, uh, for, for dinner. I use some vegetable uh, fluids. Great. Yeah. And of course, and, uh, we, we need to and, uh, and keep ourselves and in a very good mood, right? You enjoy your life. That's very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. What does delivering as one mean to you? I think the first and uh, we need to consider the, the different mandate of the various agencies. But it doesn't matter. But we can share information and do things and in a complementary way. And where we are display the various strength of different agencies. Yeah. Like an, the comparative advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like what you are doing right away, quite rightly. And you promote share information and share the, the philosophy and, and also and try to and find a solution to some of the common problems. That those things, yeah. And uh, we need to and uh, we are stick to the again the UNSDSF document the co- cooperation the framework of, that's the important the UN document the U- for UNCT and uh, of course we are also at the same time we need to uh, align our own mandate and also the common strategy that those things are very important and um, it's also very important uh, for us to have the common and the service support system like what we're doing right now the BOS. Of course, and the uh, different country and uh, have a different context. I think and the uh, bigger space for us to prove continuously uh, yeah, to deliver as one. Well. Yeah, that's work in progress. That's the vision of the Secretary General of the right. UN, which is fully reformed, delivering as one. Right. You know, joined up. You know, and right. making sure we leave no right. one behind. So, you know, my final question, Dr. Chu, is that you've been in the system, you've been in government, held senior level positions, you've seen many UN resident coordinators come and go. What, in your view, what makes an ideal UN resident coordinator? Okay, you are uh, quite experienced, I see, and of course. But from my aspect and uh, perspective, and uh, I think and, uh, you as RC and could be very good uh, in a good, good position to, uh, uh, for the UN advocacy and for the UN uh, philosophy propositions, and uh, also and, uh, near to a circular stage and uh, for the, all the country teams to play. And, 
and also and to motivate and inspire the, the various agencies, the UN staff, and to deliver their mandate and their, their activities. And also, another, last but not least, it's very important for you to and consolidate and the various sources and help us to mobilize more funding, more resources to deliver the activities. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. I think, Dr. Chu, your story will make a lot of impact. I'm, I'm sure there'll be countless young people in China who will be very inspired by your story. You know, I think the fact that you know, people say either you're born with a silver spoon or a golden spoon or a bronze spoon. You were born with no spoon. And given the odds that you overcome, I think yours is a very fascinating story. So first of all, my congratulations to you for the journey that you've undertaken. And second of all, you know, for me, it's an honor and a privilege to call you a colleague and a friend. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And give, this, give me this opportunity and looking forward and you will make more progress under your small leadership. Thank you. Dr. Chu and for sharing your story and sharing your time with us today. If you would like to learn more, visit china.un.org or follow UN in China on our Twitter feed. Join us next time for another installment 